I would like to uh, now ask a few questions for open discussion. So just everybody who wants to, um, to jump in there. Um, coming from this challenging, the, in, in what Gail said about, um, you know, really having to be the best at what you did. And I think that that's often what women have to deal with to, you have to be better than the man to get the same opportunities. So um, what did you have to do to position yourself, and that's for each one of you, um, as a woman having to do the best in your family or you know, as you started in the arts? You know, how, how did that uh, translate for you in, in your life and career? I, I think if I didn't have, if I hadn't grown up when I did, that I wouldn't have had that challenge and that competition against men, that I, who knows where I would have been. I think it kind of, it worked for me um, to push me farther. And when I, when I was young, I used to do arts and craft shows at malls when they were kind of higher end, you know, back in the 70s. And I would make these hardwood boxes you couldn't figure out how to open, and they were technically really nice. And people would come up and go, who did those, your husband, your boyfriend, whatever. <laughs> it was just amazing. And I think that being my first kind of foray into the art world, as cheesy as it was, it's, it made me realize how, how important it was to do it really well, and how it, that, that really got attention, and that you know set my art in this category where it wasn't just I wasn't just doing it and to make the art. I was doing it to make the art look good. Anyone else? Well, I certainly had a lot of difficulty as a teacher. Uh, I seem to have snuck in the back way. I did not know that there was this prejudice against women. Sculptors. I didn't even think of it as a male-dominated field. My instructor happened to be a woman. She'd been hired during World War II when there was a shortage of men. And so, you know, I was studying with her. And that was that. It was only after I was hired as an instructor at the California, then California College of Arts and Crafts that I began to see the problems. I mean, I would be sitting in a meeting with my fellow teachers, and I would come up with some suggestion or some idea and pass right over me. Mm -hmm. Someone else would speak and say pretty much the same thing, and oh, how that's very wise. Someone else being a man. <laughs> that's right. They were all, they were all men. I taught in a, 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 a department that had were five, five men and me, mm -hmm. and wow. it, was, it was really tricky. And then, of course, then there's the issue of women. I mean, the first time my job was threatened was when a, a new a woman was hired, but she was having an affair with the, cat, the uh, head of the department, and he wanted to keep her on. And so I was, I was to go. So, oh, Bella! Well, I was, you knew what you had to do. <laughs> I, I fought. I fought. <laughs> I even had to uh, go before the Equal Opportunities Commission and have a ruling in my favor. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, did, I did look around for another job, and there wasn't a woman yeah. teaching sculpture in a hundred mile radius, and I had a husband and two children. It was, what year was that? This was 1971, 72. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So that's how I became involved in the women's movement. But I never, I, I really feel that I don't have to try to express my female sensibility, that it, will, it just comes out. As Brigitte said, she's seen men making, a lot of men making metal sculpture, and it, sculpture and it doesn't look like anything like mine, nor does it have those concerns. Um, but it's, it's been a, a really difficult uphill battle Probably until this chair retired, I was constantly uh, bucking up against him. He wouldn't recognize me if I walked past him. So I decided not, not to recognize him. I walked past him without saying hello. 
and there's this footsteps following. He says, don't you say hello? <laughs> Come here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, crazy right. world. Well, did you feel like you had to excel because you were a woman? And, and I had, I've, I've always felt I had to excel. I don't think being a woman or not in, being a woman. In a male world, that was not the I, I just always have tried to do better, to push the edges of my work mm -hmm. however I could. That's not been an issue. But there been... Oh, when, when I fought for my job, I, was, I began to, I was a really shy, introverted person. And it changed my character. Mm. And I organized the women on campus and became pretty well known. And then I was elected graduate head. <laughs> From being fired to graduate head because i become known and because I fought. And so I became recognized, which is- But some, you were elected. I was elected by the, to being that's chosen. Yeah. I was elected by the faculty, but I don't think they would have. Majority of them were male anyway. They wouldn't have given me any respect if I had fought right. and and won. Yeah. Great. Uh, and in terms of the galleries, of course, all I can echo. Uh, you know, you're an exception, but there's always been a struggle for the quality of my work, which I think is excellent. Uh, I've had difficulty getting proper representation, but I, it's more important for me to do the work than anything else in my life, certainly right now, so I do it. Great. <laughs> so glad you do. Anyone else wants to jump in? So in 1971, when I was 16, my mom took me to a feminist um, gathering in suburban New Jersey, and I sat and listened to the women that probably were, you know, maybe, you know, 20 years, 10 years younger than I am now, and I couldn't understand what they were talking about. I was that invincible age where you go, I can do whatever I want, you know? How is it that society will stop me? And I guess I ran out of the, kind of the space in the room and went out at 16 and a half and, and started to become a ceramic artist. Um, and. I too can identify with you know being called a ball buster because I was actually in a leadership position and people would come up to me and they would say, "I heard you're a ball buster," <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, that that's called leader." <laughs> um, so and I wore the tennis shoes and brought the high heels with me in the bag so you could be a woman and work on the, you know, the 14th floor of um, Skidmore Owens in Maryland and look like you belonged. Um, I would never wore the ties, you know, but I've come to art very late in my life. I was 55 when I started um, graduate school, um, pretty much because I wanted to know what was the difference between art and business and uh, design. So that's an awkward place to be. Um, I've actually described in some of my critiques that I felt like a piece of coal on a pristine white field because as a art student or as a critiquer in an art field, as a designer and a business person, I would bring in this sort of like dirt, you know, that was the coal, like how could you talk about business? And I think that we are leaders for the younger group who can inherit this struggle that we created and we, we did change and the world is very slow to change but um, I, I think about the woman, I think she's from Afghanistan who um, risked her life in order to uh, speak up and say she reads and she wants to learn, to, she wants the privilege to vote and someone asked her how could you do that and she said well I was dead without the right so why wouldn't I speak up and I think that's representative of the struggle that we've taken on and um, it's nice to feel that feminism can enter now with a softer celebration of being feminine and not having to take on the attributes of, you know, looking at the male world and saying, well, in order to succeed that is success and um, we have opportunities to define our own success. And I, I see young people doing that, and I'm really encouraged in how I've taught students. And I have another anecdote. 
I was chosen as Woman Artist of the Year in Fresno, and my nine-year-old granddaughter came to the opening, and she looked at the woman artist, and she said, why do they say woman artist? If it was a man, they would say man artist. <laughs> so she, she was picking it up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As I said in the beginning, we shouldn't have a <laughs> women's show, but yeah, yeah. This is something that also I've been thinking about a lot lately in, in doing all this reading and, and thinking. When the 20 people answered the ArtNet question, they were all looking at how do we measure up in a male-dominated world? What is the measure of success? And they all but one said, women are behind. You know, we are not at the same level as men in this Male defined criteria of success. What are you talking about, aesthetic level or monetary level? Mm, that's exactly <laughs> where it all comes down to because I think when they say women are not as successful as men, they say <clears throat> monetarily. Mm. So they say dealers who are male makes more, make more money, artists who are male make more money, um, you know, museum creators who are male make more money. But Really, is that the only way that we can measure success? Could, can we reclaim um, a, me a different measure of success? I started really late, well, probably about 15 years ago. Um, I went to school in fine arts at UC Davis, and then I went into graphic design because I wasn't ready to sort of express who I was. I wanted to solve other people's problems, and, and I wanted to make money. So, um, so I went into graphic design and, and quickly got into the corporate world. And so I was successful in that corporate world, but I was fighting all the time. To, you know, um, and when I finally decided that I was ready to leave that and just become a full-time artist and just work on that, um, I, d I don't feel that competition anymore. I get because I'm working so much on my own, but it's more of a competition against myself. Um, it's more of just you know because my my art is for me. It's for my collectors. It's for me. It's for the galleries. But it's not you know I don't compare myself with other artists, mm -hmm. female or male. So you, you've you've achieved this, your measure of success and yes. and, and balance in right. your life. But yeah. And yeah, and that, I think part of that has to do with that I've already gone through that, and part of it has to do with the age of that, you know. That's true. Um, I think as for any artist, success is being able to afford to make, be an artist, <laughs> to be able to make a piece. Yeah. And for me, I think I've been really successful because almost every idea I've been able to manifest and I don't know how else to measure being an artist and yeah. successful. I mean, I just don't know any other way. Yeah. I don't see it as a comparison at all, success in the art world. I mean, I don't know how you can, anybody, it's like apples and oranges. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think once I crawled out of the shadow of how I was raised, somewhere in my 20s, yeah. I, I began to evaluate you know, what was really important to me and found that that some of the things that maybe society viewed as important when I sat down with myself in a quiet place realized weren't, weren't important to me. And um, so I, from that point on, began to pursue things that intuitively um, made sense to me. And it's been a very, you know, unique path. And I feel as if I have achieved success. I'm anticipating more success as I continue down the road. And I'm always um, surprised by some of the, the turns in the road, uh, both good and bad, that um, life presents to us all. And the challenge is to weave that into where you've been, um, how you're thinking. And um, it's not all about money. 
Um, I'm always sort of, I mean, certainly you have to be able to pay your rent and, you know, move around and, and eat. But, um, <laughs> but beyond that, I mean, I've never really, and, and quite frankly, some of the more mainstream, um, you know, art goals that some of my classmates and um, colleagues aspire to, it's, it's fine for them, but I, I actually am not, I don't embrace the art world entirely with a lot of love. I think there's some segments of it that are fairly destructive and driven by power and all sorts of things. And I'm just not interested in being a part of that. If I happen to fall into something that feels right, uh, my intuition kind of sends me there, then, then I'll examine it as it comes up. But I, it's, it's uh, definitely been more of an intuitive process and um, a personal journey as opposed to, well, you know, I need to do this because that's what you do. It just that never works for me. I have to just kind of go with my own, my own internal, um, you know, compass. I guess is the right word. Well, in a way, my becoming an artist had a great deal to do with my female status. Um, when I went to college, I had to fight to go to college. In my family boys would go to college, but girls had to go to secretarial school, and I fought to go to college. But the, I had to promise my parents that I would do something which would give me a living. Mm. And at that time, it was either nursing or yeah. teaching. Yeah. So I became an early childhood kindergarten teacher. Mm. And my husband and I moved to California from New York, and I was teaching in Vallejo, and I yeah. became pregnant. And I quit teaching because it was hard. But in the eight and a half months when I was really close to it, I, I lost the, the pregnancy. And there were, it, was, it was my first contact with death. It was a baby carriage, there were all of the stuff. And that actually lifted me beyond my sights as a female because death really makes you aware that we all are going. And what is it that I want to do in this life is the most important thing. And that's when I started to go back to art school. And I'd leave, I, I had a pregnancy, my daughter, and I'd leave her with the neighbors and I'd study at the California kind of College of Arts. Sometimes I'd bring her in the baby carriage. To the, they, of course, you can't do that anymore, but it was a smaller college then. But, it was actually that experience of, of a death of a pregnancy that, that made me break through what had been really heavy, heavy um, repressions as a child. I wonder what, if each one of you feels anger, just living in this world, powerlessness. I do a lot. I listen to the news and I'm angry and then I'm sad. Um, how does that, is there something in particular that, that angers you or that sets that off for you and then how do you, does that come into your work or does that? Clearly the news affects me. I have respond the same way you do and it somehow comes out in the form of what I would call irony and humor because I'm trying, I don't think it's, it's, it's difficult for people to take harsh truths. It's much easier to reach them through humor. And that affects kind of how I deal with it. But definitely the news is a constant <laughs> problem of melancholy. And I try not to be angry because anger consumes your energy. But I do feel powerless in that. In that. I guess I used to, you know, be more emancipate the men kind of attitude, but I don't really, I think empowerment is like a, an individual path to feel like empowered, not powerful, but empowered. And you could be a controlling, powerful person and still not feel empowered. So that's kind of been my path is just to feel empowered. And I guess, it's been hard because I've been really competitive and that's what used to make me mad is when men got more than I got. But I think this comes from a more <laughs> uh, 
crude place of my mom always gave us the same equal amount of everything when we were kids. So I always thought we're all supposed to get the same. And that's just not. And then I had a friend, and her parents would tell her, life's not fair. She did a lot better in life than I did. So <laughs> I've had to learn that, yeah, it's not fair. I'm not going to get everything. The world's not fair. And the last couple of years, I think when I get mad, I have, and from being more empowered, I realize. You know, being a vegan in a world, you know, where there's so much animal abuse, I was like always pissed off. And then I just thought, you know, I'm the only one that's mad here. Do I really want to go there? So I get mad a lot less and make fun of things a lot more. So um, let's see. The daughter of a rageaholic, um, for me, <laughs> under anger is um, fear and pain. And so I started looking at the pain and realized that if you allow vulnerability, um, a lot of people will come forward and admit that they're vulnerable themselves or it becomes a, a road or an entrance gate to intimacy. And sharing with someone the idea that allowing vulnerability can create strength, I feel is an antidote to um, you know, I, I, I really am a pacifist, you know, like I don't understand what's going on in the world and the aggression and the anger. It just, it doesn't seem the path. And so a lot of my work also has been trying to um, uh, create things that are beautiful that stimulate people's willingness to take, take in um, some of the beautiful things and you know there there are awful things going on in the world and yet you will still hear in the middle of war babies are born because people want to have the hope and that their lives go on and they create things in in the center of war and um, also if people come together across the sides of um, conflicting armies they actually realize that their people with the same goals in life often and that that will hold when they go back into their respective sides and they want to create change through that and so I don't give a lot of energy to anger however being the daughter of a rageaholic it sits in there and it's hard work to get rid of painful try to go there like Carol and not let it consume too much. I mean, there are issues that get me going. Um, I'm also a little bit of a um, proponent of multiple realities. And, uh, you know, sometimes I sort of just create my own, my own vision of the world and it comes out through the art and um, try to stay in some of those places because it keeps me balanced. Um, you know, when I was in my 20s, I used to protest things and, you know, sleep on campuses with, you know, apartheid and all these different issues. Um, but I find as I grow older that um, perhaps that realm should be given over to those who can stay up 24 hours at a time and, and enjoy <laughs> that kind of uh, being arrested and, and that sort of thing. And that maybe there's a certain wisdom that um, the number of years have given to me that can help me to be a little more um, savvy about how, how I use my, that it is sort of a decision whether to constantly get angry about the fact that there's traffic <laughs> or to maybe use that time to, to think about that next project, um, really sort of you know, managing my energy in a different way and, and creating things that maybe, will, like Bella, you know, use humor to kind of draw people in uh, to what are serious issues. I mean, there are serious issues there, but um, sometimes people can't access that or don't want to access that. And sometimes I make things, they only get the funny part. They don't get that there's something underneath. And that can be okay. Can't expect everyone to, to really embrace the totality of my meaning. I mean, sometimes I can't embrace the totality of my meaning. <laughs> Why could I should expect other people to? But, but just to kind of, um, I don't know. Um, I, I wish I was, um, had a magic wand and could certainly alter the course of some of the things that involve people dying um, from lack of food or from, from war, yeah, war or, or those kinds of things. But unfortunately, I'm one individual, and I feel like my, if you will, my genius is to perhaps present things 
in a different way and, um, and to remain sort of hopeful um, you know, in terms of how that, that might affect other people. I'm affected by everyone I meet and incorporated into um, what I do next. And um, it's a journey. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of an evolution. I can't really know what's out there next. So take it one step at a time, I guess. Jane, did you? Um, I'm very similar to both of you guys. I, um, I fight to stay, I don't fight. I really try hard to stay positive and to not have anger in my life. And um, sometimes I'm guilty of putting my head in the sand. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of looking at things from a different perspective. We, you know, my, I'm, I have a very charmed, blessed life. I always have. Um, I get really angry when I um, hear about things that are happening, to, especially to young women, the traffic, sexual trafficking, and that type of thing. I, I get angry, with, and um, but. I do try to I do try to deal with humor, and I and with some of those issues in my work, and I I do try to just stay look at it from a different perspective and stay as balanced and as as positive as as I can. Balance, huh? is that mm -hmm. what we? Are you a leader? Yeah. <laughs> I like that saying balance. Also, I see that when I swing by. The act of creating it itself is a meditative act and enables a certain amount of peace. I do feel more peace when I'm at the studio. Mm -hmm. And I can forget. I mean, it, it may be all streaming through me in terms of the irony and, what, uh, you know, and the unhappiness, but at the time that I'm working, I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think we share that in common as, as uh, women who make uh, and use materials, that there's a body and there's a kinesthetic alignment that's possible and the work gets influenced by the brain process that's going on and sometimes way far in the background. Um, you know, for a, for a while I used to listen to music all the time and now sometimes I just shut it off, you know, because it's like, okay, I don't need that. I just want to be here with the, with the work that I'm making and just not have other influences going on. There's a lot more meditation in that. And so we're all kinesthetic workers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to open to questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here because it's been so fascinating listening to you. Uh, I wondered if a, uh, an 18 year old girl came to you tomorrow and said, I'm going to go to art school. What kind of um, counsel would you give her? <laughs> Having taught for 35 years, both here and in Africa, I've discovered that somehow the training, the thinking outside of the box that art school provides usually leads to a, a reasonable career in life. It doesn't have to be art, but it is a good form of education, and I would certainly support an 18-year-old going to art school. I agree with that, but I also, somewhere along the line, um, I had a conversation with someone, and at the conclusion of that conversation, we both decided that if you could live your life and not go to art school, not make art, do it, because it's not easy. And it's only if that impetus within you has to happen that you should really you know, dedicate your life to that. And I, and, but I, I certainly I've known friends who've gone to art school, they've gone on to do very different things and were nourished by that art school experience. But if, for the long haul, you know, if you can get away with not doing it, don't do it. <laughs> I, I agree with you about the need to do it. I mean, there is yeah. a kind of addiction, yes. obsession, and not everyone who goes to school will have that obsession 
only those who do, and it's 5% or less, yeah. will do it. But the education yes. itself is, I think, a really valuable yes. one. Yeah, so, so using any, anyone who can learn about creativity, is a, it's a useful tool. Um, art education um, is only one place where you can learn that act of creativity. Um, you know, I had a, I guess the advice I would give is get to know yourself while you're in school or get to know yourself while you're alive because <laughs> 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 it will be useful <laughs> and art is, art is one way to do that, you know. Um, and it's a wonderful way if that's what she chooses. Don't do it. Save your money for art supplies. But you know what? My, my daughter came to me and said, I'm going to study art. And I caught myself. I, I was going to say, no, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, how could you say that to her? <laughs> And my work is large-scale installation, site-specific, and social issues. I'm I try not to be long-winded, but I'm going to apply for a grant. As and they're calling this grant for artists as activists. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm mm -hmm. so one. That's a little bit of a struggle for me because they are asking me to say, what do you hope to accomplish? And what impact do you want to have? And so my question is, do you consider yourself activists? And once again, this is this measure, this measure thing. How, how do you, I think m my work does make change on a very basic, personal, emotional level. I'm not sure, maybe it's just the fight I have within myself of, oh, I have to, write this thing to fit that box. I'm don't, not a big inside the box person. So um, this is my question clear. That's what, a great question. You consider yourself activists and, and are, as, are artists activists. And then is activism need to be framed in the traditional sense of the word that you have to turn so many lives around. You have to have so much data. You have to have so many results in order to Prove yourself. That's my question. question. If you want a grant, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you better fit right in that box because yeah. there's so it much competition. But awesome. there will be people who know the right words, the right adjectives, have the right references, have the right track record, and the competition is competition. Not to dissuade you in any way, shape, or form, but just the reality is that it's competitive. But I've always been. There's a film on me, where I'm, I'm saying this, so I'm reminded of it. You don't really know the effect that yeah. art has. Right. There's no way right. to measure it. And yet, it's part of the cultural richness yes. of our times. You're contributing to people's thought processes and intelligence. I believe that that's what happens if you're making the best art you can. Yeah. And, and they want to know that that money is going to the person or people who can have the best outcomes. These are all yeah, sort of grant speak yeah. words. And yeah. you have to envision, you know, how big an audience, who's going to see it, and be able to articulate, articulate that in a way that a it can key. capture them. <laughs> yeah. Right. So right. I think uh, Brigitte kind of said it in a really nice way, and we're women, so. Um, the idea that women want to define their competency when they write something, and a man, yes. you know, cliche-ish, is that they will give the vision. And I think the question is around vision. And I, I don't think it's a gender-specific thing. <laughs> I think any time any of us are going to be measured, we want to, I know I start out with, this is how I'm competent, and so I need to prove to both myself as I write and as I expect their reading that I'm competent. And if I throw that away and I start with my vision, I actually am much more concise. You need to so, be excited about okay. so, so I think that's the one thing. And then I'm not sure about all grants, but um, in competitions, if you're an artist, if your art doesn't have the presence visually to describe what it is that you're going to say what your vision is, you won't have anybody ever read your vision. Mm. 
So you should look to your art to define the answer. Hopefully, if you have already framed it in your art, that'll be your activism. It's very, they're very exciting pieces. It's all about the visual. Right. Right. So. How to measure. It's how to explain what that change yeah. is to someone who's looking inside that box. Yes. I guess they're, maybe they're not looking for numbers. Maybe they are looking for vision. They often have a person at the foundation uh -huh. that will answer questions. If you know, if you find out who that person is, and some—I mean, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It depends on what kind of questions you ask. But that they—I I found them to be to want to be helpful within the parameters of not giving things away, you know, that that might be detrimental to others. Um, yeah, the Center for Creative uh, for Cultural Innovation will give you a grant to take a workshop. You have to sign up for the workshop first and then they will actually give you, refund you the money once you've taken the workshop on how to write grants. And it's in San Francisco. Thank Center you. for this Cultural Innovation. Just because you're, uh, you know, some of my work is has to do with young writers. Just because you do find that your work is meaningful, that's what you want to do. So you can be creating that you know, that you're trying to make somebody. Well, I do do, yeah. I, it depends on your, your, the issue, I mean, Am I going to affect people that don't have guns? Probably not. Am I going to affect people who eat meat and I'm trying to tell them about what factory farm is like through my art? Well then personally, yeah, sometimes we can make a difference. I might have people come up and say, I didn't know that issue exists. I didn't know they still trapped animals. I didn't know this. And so they're more likely to take a step. But you know, people who have guns and people who don't have guns usually live and have a different you know, sensibility. So. I'm not going to probably make much change, but I'm going to have a lot of fun and point a lot of fingers and just have a good time. And that's kind of sometimes all I want to do is, you know, we're talking about age here, which I think we're all pretty close to the same age, except for all of us, uh, except for all of us here, are pretty close to the same age. So I think there's generational things too that you get. I, I don't know. I think women my age get to the age where. You know, this is not important anymore, and this is important anymore. So I think my art right now is more about how long can I do this? How long, you know, I look younger, but I'm getting close to 60. How long can I actually schlep around pieces of steel? And so it's different issues, different times. But as for activism, I guess it depends on your issue, really. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Do you have one more question? Right. Well, I want to thank you all very much. We can now go to a cool space at the gallery. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We have one of the <laughs> I want to do a quick pitch for this catalog. Um, Tracy, um, is Tracy here? She yeah, did she just back. an incredible job laying this out and putting this together. Um, and it's beautiful. And for those of you who are interested um, in bringing one of these home today, we have copies that are being signed by the five artists. <coughs> Very special. Uh, and they're $50. And if you purchase a piece of sculpture today, we will give you a catalog to take home. So, and a, and a range this is sculpture from the show, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.